Jaswowski, welcome to Show Studio. It's great to be here. I'm what glad. An honor. Well, it's so, it's so amazing to talk to you because you know you personally had an amazing relationship with Lee McQueen, and Swarovski worked with him sort of very closely. But also, you know, Swarovski in making the Savage Beauty exhibition happen in some respects. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you first came to meet Lee McQueen. Well, our introduction really came by Isabella Blow, mm -hmm. and um, you know my. Um, vision working or growing up in a family business was really um, taking my grandfather as a role model. He worked with Christian Dior and Coco Chanel mm. and always used to tell me Most these stories people. exactly about visiting them in Paris at their studios but also inviting Monsieur Dior for example um, to the factory in Austria and I was just fascinated about that entire process and Monsieur Dior for example wanted a stone that emanated northern light mm -hmm. so my grandfather developed a stone called Aurora Borealis which today is still is one of our best-selling stones mm -hmm. it has this shimmer effect mm -hmm. But so then when I eventually started to work in the business, I realized, my gosh, there's no emphasis on fashion. How can I replicate what my grandfather was doing mm. and who is the Dior equivalent of, of the today. 21st century? Mm. And um, then my father actually met Isabella Blow and she just was convinced she needed to con introduce us to this young man called Lee McQueen. Mm. So uh, my father put me in touch with Isabella and she made that introduction and we just felt there was somebody who had such an amazing appreciation of materials, yeah. working with woods, with plastics, with rubbers, with metals, with fabric, of course. And we thought this definitely would be a person who would appreciate crystal mm. as yet mm. another creative ingredient to work with for his creations. Mm. And we invited him to come to Austria. And I think people always have a completely different concept of Swarovski when they come to Austria because mm. they realize it's all about the, the stone manufacturing. Mm. And um, I think that's when he realized, no, the stone can really help his creation yeah. and emphasize his creativity. And um, I think it gave him the vision of how he really could implement the crystals in a way that Because he did use them in such McQueen. different ways, from collection to collection, didn't he? That's one, you know, the way they're used in deliverance is so different to how we see, you know, sometimes they're very glamorous and opulent, sometimes they're used almost in a kind of, quite a, you know, th that beautiful sort of dark, sinister way that he does. Did absolutely. he always kind of surprise you with how he managed to incorporate them? He completely them? surprised us. And, um, but you're absolutely right, he used the various different types of crystals. So for example, there's a material called crystal mesh, um, which he used as an armor almost, as a mm -hmm. top, and then um, it was a hood that really covered the entire face. Um, so although it looked like armor, that crystal mesh is so delicate and mm -hmm. absolutely molds on the skin. So that kind of dichotomy that was created mm -hmm. by the structure that he created was amazing. And then he juxtaposed that crystal mesh with very sheer silk fabric. Mm -hmm. And again, that created such incredible dynamic. Um, one outfit was fully embroidered mm -hmm. and it was a, a, a tiger print just made of beads which was this very tight corset, huge, a fantastic impact. Yeah. Um, then there was one piece he worked together with Sean Lean on which was um, again an armor-like metal piece that just had um, red crystal studs on it. Mm. Um, and then of course he also used our transfer material, which is a flat back stone, which is applied directly to the fabric. To onto the fabric. Um, and then throughout the years, you know, he just um, used a lot of the sew-on stones, which mm. adds so much more depth and dimension to the fabric. Um, in particular, one of his last collections, which was that crystal collection, the crystal pattern was printed onto the fabric on top of which then the same type of crystal was sewn on. So it was this triple effect of crystal in different colors, um, so different dimensions and certainly different reflections and mm. it was really magical but he really pushed it to its max. It p he pushed the use of crystal beyond uh, what we have seen before and he did he defy your expectations? Totally, absolutely. Yeah. He made it work and he used materials that have been sitting in our warehouse for so long but totally reinvented it. So there was one material caused, uh, called crystal net and that was used in the 60s and 70s to cover these velvet opera bags. Very mm. conservative use yeah. of crystal net and of course he used it and he draped it around the body and he draped it around hats. And suddenly this crystal net took on a dimension of its own. Yeah, holy wow. And it was so fascinating to see that an old existing material could be totally reinterpreted by merely shaping it up, changing its application. Absolutely. It didn't actually require the change of the crystal itself, it just needed to change the application. Mm. 
and uh, that was just a reminder to us of yeah, you know, what you have, the exactly. continuous need of having to push ourselves beyond our comfort zone Absolutely. and our boundaries. And tell me about seeing his work, because I, I believe the first so show you saw, it was number 13, is that right? Yeah. Do you remember how you kind of responded when you first saw his work in a sort of a runway context? It was amazing. Uh, there was so much movement. It was uh, more show than a fashion show. Yeah. The models would stop, they would start rotating, they were splashed with paint, they were very rigid in their uh, facial expression, you know, it wasn't a fashion show. Mm. Um, and that was the beauty of it, and that almost emphasized the creation of the f use of fabric within fashion so much more, because mm. it wasn't expected. Uh, almost mundane walking up and down the catwalk, yeah. you know. And I think um, that um, entire curatorship certainly gained a greater attention of the mm. viewer mm. and appreciation mm. um, of what's happening on the stage, so to speak. It was yeah, really you a felt stage almost immersed in Absolutely, your picture, yeah. totally. It's um, interesting to talk about, you know, you mentioned how kind of he influenced you guys in, in terms of sort of, you know, constantly thinking how you should innovate and what you could do with your materials, but he also inf influenced how you work and, and the kind of projects that you want to be involved <coughs> with, particularly sp supporting young designers. That's something that also came out of your That's relationship. Right, absolutely. And Tell me more about that. Well, we just felt, you know, it's amazing. So often, you know, the fashion industry is so incredibly competitive yeah. and um, I, we just felt so often young talent just doesn't have the chance to shine. Yeah. It doesn't have the chance to even um, expose its talent. Absolutely. So just the, even the smallest financial contribution means um, a better location for your show means a better makeup artist, better lighting, better music, mm -hmm. all of that, which just contributes to a greater show and um, a greater ability to get the attention of the press and your customer. Sure. Um, and then, of course, you know, the addition of the crystal always adds glamour. Yeah. Um, and we have we see it inevitably whenever there's a standing ovation or whenever ever there's a reaction within the viewers uh, within a runway show. It's usually the piece that contains crystal that evokes that reaction. that reaction and it's a subconscious reaction you know people yeah. don't know why they're just reacting this way it's just it's a subconscious reaction to the light mm -hmm. um and, and the it helps play of light designers work, that it? the crystal evokes mm -hmm. um no but you're right so that certainly started a blueprint for us you yeah. know to support the emerging talent and um allow them to be recognized, allow them to be acknowledged and eventually celebrated by the industry. Mm. Um, what we felt also was very important was the contribution of the emerging talent in terms of the competition yeah. within fashion design. And uh, we just feel that the established houses have never looked better yeah. now that there's so much young emerging talent exactly. on the scene, you yeah. know? And that competition is good news for the end consumer. You know, we mm. just, we, we as an end consumer get a better product yeah. because of that competition. And it's hard, isn't it, to think because someone like Lee McQueen has such an interesting trajectory. You know, he was, I, I worry sometimes that, you know, designers today who came from a background such as his, you know, did works as a, as an apprentice, you know, tried to apply for a teaching job, then got accepted on the MA. Like, you know, perhaps that they wouldn't be able to have that path into fashion without kind of the financial support from mm -hmm. from companies or from you know institutions, you know, such as yourself. It's it's a really hard time, isn't it, to be a designer? It is a hard time, but I think um, the world has changed incredibly. The paradigms have changed. Um, yeah. I have to say, in the last fifteen years within fashion and standards that were kind of unaccepted or unacceptable 15 mm. years ago are now acceptable and that's really the creative realm and yeah. there are certain behaviors within the creative industry that to big corporations seem so odd and strange and unprofessional yet yeah. it is actually such a necessary way of being in order to continuously be expressive creatively. Yeah. So I think um, what we've really seen in the last 15 years is a better merger of that corporate thinking and the creative thinking. Mm -hmm. I think there's a greater tolerance and I think big companies are also realizing that it's actually the creativity that ends up in the bottom line. You yeah. can't just force a bottom line to happen. It's actually creativity that creates that commerce. Yeah. So, um, and I have to say, this is where McQueen is such a wonderful story, you know, to really have come from a situation where he really needed the financial su support to suddenly yeah. becoming a very successful um, fashion brand. Yeah. But I have to say, it's really his creative doing, um, as you were mentioning, you know, his apprenticeship within the tailoring world, mm. but also his educational background, mm. uh, merged with his own creative vision and his own personal background. Um, 
came to such a beautiful product. And I also, you know, as a non-Brit, um, I also feel a dichotomy between the British Empire and yeah. the British people. And that also comes together in the work of McQueen. You yeah. know, he wants to express and celebrate the customer. Yet there's so many references also to the British heritage, which Absolutely. are wonderful. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is almost England's contribution to a fantastic fashion designer, yeah. or to making a fantastic fashion designer. Um, but the amazing thing also about Lee was that he stuck to his guns, yeah. you know, and he never compromised his creativity. Yeah. And um, I think his educational background allowed that as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. uh, to happen, but also his creative um, environment, you know, having worked with Nick yeah. and the likes of Nick, which um, are such an incredible, or have been such an incredible support system to him, Isabella, his muse, yeah. um, you know, these supportive forces have allowed him to continuously push forth his creativity. Yeah, and be totally and fearless as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it took time, but at the end of the day, it really had a huge financial positive impact. and. That, in terms of fashion history, yeah. is a really important chapter. And that must have made you really you know, proud to watch, but sort of proud for want of a better word, because as someone who you know, financially supported him and, and, and helped out in terms of, kind of that business side almost, as well as the creative side, obviously, to watch him grow from being, as you say, this kind of young, amazing creative into this huge brand that really has a huge, like, had a big impact on fashion. That must have been incredible to watch. It was so fascinating to watch, and that just shows me, you know, stick to your guns um, and be who you are, because at the end of the day, that is exactly what gains the credibility. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I have to say, I had to push him myself yeah. in our organization, and um, I perhaps also ran the risk of impacting my reputation with yeah. my decision-making process, but I stuck to my guys. Yeah, I was going to ask that, and it worked out. Because you, you mentioned at the start how you, know, you really were passionate about bringing high fashion back into kind of what Swarovski were doing. But was it ever tricky? Did you ever get people within within the company who were saying, you know, who is this guy? Because press reaction to his work wasn't always That's fantastic. Right. Exactly, and uh, some of my colleagues reacted to his press reactions. I reacted to him as a person. Absolutely. And that makes just such a different you, difference when you meet the person and you hear their vision and you get a sense of who they are and their feelings and mm -hmm. their passion. And um, for example, there was one um, collaboration that he did together with Tord Bontje. Mm -hmm. um, he created the Christmas tree at the Victorian Albert yeah. Museum made of crystal branches. And um, then Tord and Lee wanted to extend that into a different color, namely yellow. And again, mm -hmm. the response was, well, yellow is not a trend color. And yeah. That was from the marketing team, and I thought, well, what kind of uh, comment is that? Yeah. We just have to do it. Yeah. And of course, then that particular yellow stone became one of our best-selling best stones yeah. in the chandelier arena. So, you know, there were so many examples where we kind of defined the expectations, yeah. you know, yeah. um, but that was just because somebody who is so ultimately sensitive Mm. towards the trends, doesn't follow the trends, but actually creates, creates the trends, them. and is so knowing about what the customer actually wants, yeah. and therefore is able to create a product that is relevant to the customer, was just a fascinating um, example to witness over and over. I can imagine. And tell me about your support of Savage Beauty, because you know that <coughs> must have felt so natural for you in some ways. Yeah. No, I have to say Savage Beauty is truly Swarovski's tribute to Lee McQueen, so to his amazing creativity, his creative vision, his persistence, um, and also, in a certain sense, his belief in the material crystal when yeah. people actually forgot about it or didn't believe in it. Mm -hmm. And he truly demonstrated how it could be used in the most beautiful way and relevant way, but yeah. in a way that actually celebrated him as a designer and his design, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the crystal. You know, it was an incredibly symbiotic situation. And I have to say, we, to me, if I could credit one person for reintroducing crystal to the catwalk, it is Lee McQueen. Mm -hmm. um, after he used the crystal, everyone. absolutely, everyone wanted to use the crystal, and we felt an impact in terms of our sales. Mm -hmm. And um, but I just really appreciated the times he did use the product. You know, he never used it 
when he didn't want to use it, yeah. only when he wanted to use it. And that's the only way you can use crystal in a successful way if you truly are passionate about that um, integration. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really important also is, um, I can only say as a McQueen customer myself, you mm -hmm. know, his clothes feel so amazing and empowering. Absolutely. You know, because often he creates these suits, which is n well, aren't feminine, but then he adds that feminine touch by adding the waist. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say, in this world, um, floating between the corporate world and the creative world, yeah. you know, th it's to me the perfect attire. Yeah. And it, I, I, I feel protected, like I'm wearing an armor. It's like armor. I'm wearing those clothes that are not taking away the femininity, mm -hmm. uh, but they're certainly empowering the femininity. But and I have to say that, to me, I feel McQueen um, certainly was the first designer to create that style and emphasize that style. Yeah. Um, and to me right now, still today, it's the most um, impactful yeah. style. No, it's interesting woman. that, isn't it, to be to do something which is so empowering, as you say, and, and makes women look powerful and strong without making them look mannish. That's and right, I think that's exactly. That's really interesting. Yeah. And it's interesting to think about it because his work works so well in an exhibition context, as we're going to see with Savage Beauty, but also it is for each wearer, for each person who buys it. It's so totally. You yeah. have a very intimate relationship Absolutely. with it. Absolutely. The show here, Savage Beauty, is Swarovski's tribute to Lee McQueen. Um, to Swarovski, but actually also to the fashion industry. Yeah. It's amazing um, the different tone that he has set, the different style impact that he has had, um, the incredible role model he is and yeah. will be for future designers mm -hmm. to truly stick to, stick um, to your vision and your guns and um, um, your individualism. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also, it's wonderful to have this exhibition at the VNA, which was such a place of inspiration which for loved, yeah. Lee. Mm -hmm. And you know, Swarovski supports um, by its foundation education, and um, we would like to emphasize that educational element. You know, mm -hmm. it makes such a difference to have, in Lee's case, have also had the art degree, yeah. have had the apprenticeship, but have had the art mm -hmm. and fashion degree, um, to have had these treasure chests in the UK, in London, of museums that yeah, are open for free to the mm -hmm. public to really go and get that inspiration. Which is what's so amazing about Savage Beauty is that, you know, anyone can go and see his work and it's kind of opening up things that mm -hmm. are kind of, you know, um, catwalk secrets that people discuss and talk about and reminisce about and now people can go and actually see these amazing works yeah. that people have discussed. It's Absolutely. Amazing. No, it's so true. And, um, but I think you know the historic references that museums are able to give mm -hmm. are so important just in shaping the future of the future generations, you know, mm -hmm. just that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the knowledge that McQueen gained from that museum gave him the power to absolutely. forge ahead. Well, it's a wonderful tribute. Yeah, well, we're, so, we're thrilled. We're absolutely thrilled, and we want to share it with as many people as possible. We're also excited that um, Sean Lean, and I love your Sean Lean earrings, you. by the way, <laughs> that Sean has such a wonderful, um, or plays a wonderful part in that um, exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great that Sean and various other participants will be lecturing yeah. to the general public. I think their message, um, or just their stories of the collaboration yeah, the story are so valuable and yeah. so inspirational and encouraging. And um, we certainly want to um, contribute to bringing as many people to listen and we want to share that message. I can imagine. Because you're right, it is, you know, it is in a way to have it in London when this notion of Britishness was so important to Lee McQueen's designs. It, it's kind of full circle because it is about national pride in a way and that yeah. sounds kind of you know, quite strange Absolutely. but I think to let people come and you know, be involved in someone that's done so much for sort of British culture yeah. is amazing. Absolutely. You know, I think it's really, it's, it's a very beautiful example. Mm. Um, and I think it's really call, hopefully that will be a call to action to governments, local governments, exactly. to support the design community, you know, which will arts. reflect their cultural heritage. Yeah. You know, it is um, not just skin deep, actually. Yeah. And I think McQueen certainly used fashion as his artistic uh, canvas Absolutely. of his creative vision.